Um, the, uh, you cannot understand the, you don't know anything about the book, the meaning of it, from studying the laws of, of paper and ink. You know, you can learn all there is to know about paper and ink, and you still know nothing about the information content. It's something that's different and that's separate. The information that makes the whole thing work. And of course, you can put the book on computer disk or memorize it, and the information is still the same, although the medium is totally different. My own belief is that that's true of organisms, that it's the information which is the intelligence which is encoded in them that will have to be understood separately from the biochemistry. For myself, the answer is much simpler. I don't have any kind of soul. My brain is a physico-chemical bundle of, of uh, material stuff. And when it ceases to have its blood supply, my consciousness and my awareness will disappear, and I will never be conscious again at that point. I'll just die, and I'll just rot, and that'll be the end of it. Mr. Proline's, Proline's question? A question over here for Professor Proline. Well, nobody Thanks. wants to ask Proline anymore. <laughs> Can you come forward if you have a question for Professor yeah, Proline? Professor Proline. Um, this is purely a question of evidence. Uh, Professor Johnson brought up the, the fossil record and how he, we were not finding the, uh, the columns coming together. And I've heard repeatedly, or it's been brought up repeatedly, about the Archaeopteryx and how that shows the combination of bird and reptile. But um, I'm curious, I don't, it, is there some reason that you have for the fossil record not being that more diverse and more like interrelated species? There's very good reasons why the fossil record is not so hot. If you look at the ocean floor, for example, every bit of the ocean floor is newer than 200 million years old. That's because it's been subducted. It's just gone under continents or under other plates and it's gone. So you can't look in the ocean floor and get back beyond 200 million years. All those fossils put there are gone. There are lots of reasons why fossils that are laid down would disappear in time from any kind of access to human beings. Secondly, fossils are only laid down under very special kinds of circumstances. Darwin was keenly interested in that, but modern evolutionists have a whole science of how fossils are made, and it takes very special circumstances indeed. But the fossil record is not very bad throughout. It's quite good in very many areas. For example, if you're interested in the evolution of cichlid fish in the rift lakes in the United States, let's say uh, along the existing eastern seaboard, you can get year by year by year evidence of the fossils that are there. You can watch in front of your eyes over tens of thousands of years, new species of cichlids coming into existence. I have a colleague who does that. So the fossil record has all kinds of gaps and everything in it, but it's not uniformly bad. And if you happen to be interested in the relationship of living forms to their relatively recent fossil ancestors, there's all kinds of fossil evidence of those. You notice that Phil talks about mostly fossil evidence that's hundreds of millions of years old. The, uh, uh, I might uh, just uh, add in comment on that, that uh, that is the standard old style Darwinian response to the fossil record problem. It comes from the origin of species itself. The fossil record is incomplete. Uh, but there are, there are lots of prominent fossil experts today that no longer buy that. These include the punctuationalists, uh, uh, Gould, Eldridge, and Stanley, and especially James Valentine, very distinguished professor from UC Santa Barbara who moved to, to Berkeley. And we've seen interviews with him on the Cambrian uh, record and so on. And there just isn't any good reason for that whole universe of fossils to be absent. When, for example, they're claiming fossil evidence of uh, primitive life, of, of, of bacterial, of cellular life, um, that goes back almost four billion years. Um, uh, and uh, so uh, it's generally, uh, that, that's a desperate measure, the incompleteness argument. The thing it has going for it is that you can always make it because it's, it's inherently unfalsifiable, but it's, but it's uh, by no means the only position that's out there among the paleontologists. Phil completely misunderstands modern paleontology on this point. There is no paleontologist I know of 
who argues that there is a continuous record of paleontological history. That's utter and complete nonsense. There are no paleontologists who make that argument. What he's saying is that the fossil record has been hypothesized to be better than evolutionists thought it might be 20 years ago. And there's a case to be made for that. But in no way are those evolutionists arguing that there's somehow a complete fossil record and we're seeing all of it and therefore creationism is true. That is false. I'm happy to find that there will always be a place for ethics and moderating debates between Darwinists and theists. Something for Professor Johnson. Uh, yeah, actually, I have just a simple numbers question, but first I just have to clarify your position, Professor Johnson. You're a uh, 13,000-year uh, creationist, is this, or? Uh, uh, no, I don't speak to such issues. It's, it's been my, pra I don't bring biblical issues into the discussion at all, and I don't have any particular personal position about the age questions. In my work, I assume the, you know, the official age uh, that's given, but I have not made an effort to make a personal study of radiometric dating, for example, or whatever. So I just leave that all alone. Whatever age you want is fine with me. Okay. Uh, take as much time as you want. The mutation selection <laughs> process didn't produce and couldn't have produced all these complex structures. Okay, my question is then, actually, and I was hoping both of you might address it briefly. Um, I happen to be one of the, the people in the middle category that um, you had the audience, you were, when you were polling the audience, I find personally that, that the, the least leap of faith that required is to adopt a sort of middle ground because both extremes seem quite absurd to me. But um, my question is for both of you to speak to your impressions of, and also I qualify myself as a scientist as well, so I'm sort of in the middle of everything. And my question is your impression of the entire scientific field, including biology, chemistry, uh, paleontology, all of, the, all of the sciences combined. What is your impression of the general trends? And do you think that these two extremes are tending to come to some sort of middle uh, ground? And actually, as far as the numbers are concerned, do you have any estimates? Um, Professor Probing, maybe you could just talk about biologists, but just in general, do you have any estimates of, say, the percentages of scientists that are inclined, you know, to support your well, view or his view? I, I'll take that, yes. Um, well, you know, see, if you're in this kind of science, I mean, we're not talking about electrical engineering or whatever, but in the um, uh, historical sciences, uh, you're under tremendous pressure to be a metaphysical naturalist. Uh, when people ask uh, me why a law professor would take up this uh, issue, one reason is um, that you can't really do it. In the, you can't challenge the fundamental philosophical assumptions within evolutionary biology or you won't be in evolutionary biology for very long. It's not a, a tolerant world. Um, so, so, so that's one uh, answer I'd give. Now, a second one, I think it's, it's a matter of moving to an understanding of what science is. Darwinian science is based on a 19th century positivism and a notion that the objective way to understand life, to understand anything, was in terms of these purposeless material processes. What came along with this is the idea that science is a value-free enterprise of finding fact. And although nobody at the, you know, studies the philosophy of science at a sophisticated level uh, thinks that anymore, it's really the version that's uh, uh, promulgated to the general public uh, very heavily. And in fact, some of the scientists themselves tend to believe that. I remember a debate that I had at the University of Texas with Steven Weinberg, the physicist, the Nobel Prize winner, uh, who, who discussed me critically, but not all that, you know, uh, disrespectfully in his book, Dreams of a Final Theory. Uh, and, Weinberg and I, Weinberg told me, he says, well, the thing is that we scientific materialists like I, myself, Stephen Weinberg, aren't like you Christian theists. We have the courage to see reality as it is, whereas you just believe what you want to believe. So to which I said, well, Professor Weinberg, you are a reductionist, you know, in science. That's your philosophy, which means you're a materialist reductionist, which means that everything reduces to fundamental particles, which means that you are the king of knowledge. Uh, don't you have a powerful incentive to believe this because it gives you this great position of power in, uh, in the priesthood? And of course that's the case. And one of the things I think that people are going to be learning in the coming century at the popular level, it's already known at the philosophy of science level, um, is that a tremendous amount of ideology and worldview and cultural preference and so on goes into science. That's what I'm telling you. That's why 
the evolutionary biologists found it so easy to believe that the peppered moss